can bless um, the father of this house, Apostle H. Daniel Wilson. Amen. And even our First Lady, Pastor Bev, in her absence. We just appreciate the opportunity. I always give honor um, to the ministers and elders and all the senior leaders here at Valley Kingdom Ministries International. It's always an honor to stand before you um, and go before God and present to you what I've heard from him um, to help progress his people forward. So Father God, as always we pray that through this encounter, through this experience, that we do not become more like the Pharisees nor the Sadducees, nor like the Sanhedrin Council, but that we become more like sons. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, um, today I'm going to start it off right, because I know normally I start off and I like to give nice introductions prior to giving that scripture. And I know some people, it makes them feel uneasy because they want the word to go before whatever you're getting ready to say. Start it off with the word. All right, Deacon. So I got the word today. <laughs> Isaiah 49 and 9. Um, and the message today is it's time to emerge. It's time to emerge. Scripture says in Isaiah 49 and 9, Say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. The New English translation reads this way. You will say to the prisoners, come out, and to those who are in dark dungeons, emerge. They will graze beside the roads on all the slopes. They will find pasture. Amen. So a mother carries a baby in her womb for nine months. <laughs> and it is one of the most beautiful processes that only God could have orchestrated. As the life or the baby grows, the woman's stomach begins to protrude. Try to use a nicer word other than getting big, but protrude. <laughs> and expand, showing the growth of the child. As the baby is ready to be delivered, the woman's stomach experiences a drop. And during this process, the baby descends into the pelvis, shifting itself at times in order that its head is down into the pelvis, making an indication that it is ready to be delivered. No, I have not experienced this. Google has a lot of information. Up until the point of delivery, the child has been hidden for nine months. It has been developing in secret, and the child that no one has ever seen before is now ready to emerge. To emerge means to move out of or away from something and come into view. The author Janine Baker says that birth is not an emergency. Tell that to some mothers. It is simply an emergence. Birth is a beautiful process, one that is celebrated and highly anticipated, but it is only one form of emergence. In pregnancy, the fertilized egg grows into a full baby, and as a result of that growth process in the womb, it is ready to emerge. But in another process of emergence, a caterpillar literally dies in its cocoon before it is ready to emerge as a butterfly. Both endure a transformation process. They both happen in the dark. One is in the darkness of a womb and the other is hidden in the covering of a cocoon. The, the baby emerges from life, but the butterfly emerges from death. Though they both emerge. So here is the turning point. Because I know y'all like that baby talk. But although growing and maturing often precedes emergence, at some point in every individual's life, 
you are going to have to go through a period in which death is the only way for you to emerge. In examining this process more closely, it is said that the caterpillar wraps itself up in the cocoon and begins to digest itself, releasing enzymes that dissolves all of its tissues. I went to medical school, and then I went to school for biology, too. Until it becomes liquid, I'm just playing. I, <laughs> some of y'all really believed it. Until it becomes a liquid in the cocoon. But prior to the process, the caterpillar has created what is called imaginal disc that stores all the main parts it will need to become a butterfly or a moth. Once a caterpillar has dissolved all of its tissue except for the imaginal disc, the disc used the liquid of the dissolved caterpillar as a result of the caterpillar killing itself as fuel to form the wings, the antenna, the legs, the eyes, the genitals, all while on the inside of the cocoon. And as a result of this process, a completely different form of being emerges. But with this process, there will be no emergence if there was no death. If the caterpillar never dies, then the butterfly will never live. People talk about butterflies all the time, how intricate their color scheme is, how unique of a creature they are, and how fragile they are. But have you ever considered that something had to die in order for that butterfly to live? That death was the only way for the butterfly to emerge. Then I started to think, I guess the butterfly wouldn't know to be grateful. It probably doesn't know that the caterpillar gave his life so that it might live. I don't think that the butterfly understands that all his life and the beauty of his wings, its freedom of movement, its ability to fly wherever it wants, its ability to freely eat, live, move, and have its very being, it's all because the caterpillar made a decision to hang itself and die and allow the integral parts that will cause the butterfly to live to use its body to do so. And it's time for you to live. Why? Because there has already been a death. There was a man that decided to hang himself because he knew that if there was no death, there couldn't be eternal life. He knew that if he didn't die, you couldn't live, move, and have your very being. So he hung himself. He died and he allowed you to live. He said that he has come that you may have life in it more abundantly, all as a result of his willingness to die. Do you understand that the caterpillar literally hangs itself to go through this process? But Jesus had to die so that you can emerge out of darkness, out of shadows of sin, but it goes even deeper than that. We are in the season of harvest, so let me show you this. Jesus says in John 12, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. A seed is nothing more than a seed. But when a seed is put into the ground, when it is hidden, out of that seed comes a harvest. And the seed no longer remains. After the harvest comes, no one goes back into the ground looking for that seed because they know that the seed is no longer there. The seed had to die in order that the harvest could be brought out of it. If the seed dies, then the harvest lives. But if the seed lives, then the harvest remains dead. The thing is, Harvest is already there. It's just waiting for the death of the seed. You want to hold the seed, but if you do, you prevent the birth of the harvest. Now, this goes even deeper because Jesus himself was a seed. And the father could not hold on to him if he wanted to get the harvest. So he took Jesus being the seed, placed him in the earth, just so that seed can die and that we could reap the harvest, which was you and I. But if he held on to the seed, 
he would have never been able to receive us. So he released the seed to die in the earth. That's why when they went to the tomb to look for Jesus, after his death, the Bible says that they did not find him there. Why? Because the seed no longer remains once it has released the harvest. They only saw his garments because the seed was gone and now had given access for the harvest to come forth. Them going back and looking for the seed in the tomb is like you and I going back, digging into the dirt, trying to see if the seed is still there after the harvest has already come forth. He was not in the tomb because he was the seed that produced the harvest of those that will be resurrected. The seed had served its purpose in the earth. No, he was not in the tomb, and neither is your seed still in the ground. If you want the harvest to come, you have to plant the seed. Go there, God. You want me to go there, God? You want me to go there? It's harvest time, right? But you want to hold on to the seed. You want to believe for the harvest, but you don't want to release the seed. As long as you have the seed and you don't release it and put it in the ground, the harvest is dead. Don't expect the harvest if you don't even put the seed in the ground. Some of y'all wanted to hear that. Some of y'all didn't. But seriously, you a powerful intercessor. But it's principles in the earth. I don't care how much you pray. If you don't put that seed in the ground, that harvest is not coming. You can get up at 6. You can get up at 4.30. You can stay up to 3 and pray all three of those times for the harvest to come. But the principle is put the seed in the ground. You could have slept all them hours. <laughs> You know some of y'all like sleep. Just put the seed in the ground. That's all you got to do. Go back to sleep. 1 Corinthians 15. Beginning at verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. It's the book. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. See, that's why you can't withhold the seed, because the Lord of the harvest determines what form the seed will take on. He knows exactly what you need. It will form the harvest of your seed to meet exactly what that need is. But if you withhold the seed, you don't even allow the harvest to take form. Jesus, again, was the seed that died in order that life may be our portion. He had already become the first fruit of the harvest. He was no longer the seed, but now the resurrection. Hence why he was not in the tomb. He had already become the harvest. And was no longer the seed. He set in motion once again the process of life emerging out of death. And this is vital for our understanding because the harvest is always waiting for the death of the seed. Genesis chapter 3. This is not just a New Testament thing. But in Genesis chapter 3 we read in verse 18... Beginning at verse 18, the Lord God also said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make for him a suitable helper. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name each. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. The man gave name to all the livestock, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he slept, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the area with flesh. 
And from the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her to him. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for out of man she was taken. Oh, he didn't take her from your foot. <laughs> yeah, he didn't take her from your head. No, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> but he <laughs> oh, they ready <laughs> I got a word that's not fresh of revelation but I can uh, preach it <laughs> but now when we look at this story the father created Adam he breathed life into him and then says that it is not good for man to be alone but when he says this, what does he actually mean? Because he knew that he, when he created him, that he was going to be without anyone else. This was not a surprise to God. But it was made to seem that way if we look at it in the context of what we deem to be alone. But what the father was truly saying was that Adam was separate. He was isolated. He was in a dark place. And now it was time for him to be amongst someone else. Why is this important? Why does this mean anything? It is important because God was literally saying that for Adam, it was time for him to emerge and to be presented before someone else. God caused a, a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, but this wasn't a sleep that we are accustomed to. That word sleep is raw down, which means to be cast into a death. Adam was at a point in which God wanted to reveal him to someone else, so he had to die before being revealed, and as a result of his death, God was able to pull life from out of him. See, this woman that was pulled out of Adam was not just a woman that was made to be suitable as a help me for him. She was literally life after his death. So much so that when Adam named her in Genesis 3 and 20, he named her the very thing that was pulled out of him, which was Eve, which means life. It says Adam named his wife because she would become the mother of all living. The name Eve meant life or life giver because she represented the very thing that came out of Adam after he was put to death. So what does this mean to you? I said earlier that at some point in every individual's life, you are going to have to go through a period in which death is the only way for you to emerge. We talked about Jesus' death. We talked about Adam's death. But the most important death to experience while here on earth is yours. Romans 8, beginning at verse 5. Oh, you got it up there already? My fault. You don't need to give me enough time to get no water. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. You know, um, early on in ministry, you know, when you had um, different technology, we got this advanced technology. Now, you had a lot of time to get your water, wipe your face. I mean, you got to do it all while you're preaching now. <laughs> Slow down. Thank you, Eagles Nest. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So here is the balance yet again. If you let your flesh live, then the spirit becomes null and void. But if you live by the spirit, you put to death the deeds of the flesh. Let's take it even deeper. I've shared this revelation before in a class, uh, but this is the first time from here. Genesis 3 and 14. It says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, 
Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Man, if we could see what he actually said in this statement. So when we look at Genesis 2 and 7, it's coming together. The Bible says that, that God formed man out of the dust of the ground. So the very thing you were formed out of, the very thing that clothed your spirit, the enemy has been cursed to eat all the days of his life. So you wonder why you struggle with your flesh so much. Because the enemy has been given a curse. He has been commanded to eat of the very thing that you have been created of all the days of his life. He is constantly eating at flesh, working in the flesh of man to perform the will that he desires for you to act out. But here's the good part. Here's the progressive revelation. That was his curse, but not yours. He was commanded to eat on flesh all the days of his life, but you have the ability to live and eat of the life of the spirit. He will make you believe that you are just like him and that these things cannot be overcome. He will have you to believe that these fleshly desires are just you and this is normal. He will make you think that his curse is your curse, but it's not. You don't have to be defeated by these things because greater is he that's within you than he that is in the world. His curse is not your curse. Come out, be free, and walk into your deliverance from this captivity. Break the bondage of your flesh so that you may be able to walk out your purpose and the Father's purpose. I am not saying that you are going to be perfect or that deliverance brings about perfection. But deliverance brings you out of bondage. One of the practicalities of deliverance is that what you feed will live and what you starve will die. It's said that the enemy will eat dust all the days of his life. That's flesh. Stop giving him stuff to eat. Starve your flesh, you starve the enemy. Starve the enemy so that you can have a different level of discipline. What are you controlled by? Deliverance frees you from the control of whatever has you bound. I just can't shake this thing. That's because you keep feeding it. When in reality, you need to gain some discipline so that you can have the ability to starve this thing into death. It has been controlling your life way too long, and it's time for you to emerge. All freedom does not have to come from people laying hands on you. Sometimes all it takes is just a little discipline. It's simple. We talked about it before, just, just as simple as it is to gain discipline to go to the gym. Can you believe that you could apply that same discipline to deliverance and to be free? But some of us can't even make it to the gym, and I'm one of them. That's hard. <laughs> got work, got kids, got a wife. That's hard. I can't make it to the gym. But seriously, discipline. You can take discipline and utilize that discipline to starve the very thing that you're fighting and gain victory in those areas of your life. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at 45. See, it's already up there. <laughs> Time out. What a break. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at 45. The first man, Adam, became a living being. 
The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual, the first man was the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And, is, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. So shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. You have been wondering what this dark place has been. All of your life, you have made decisions out of your flesh, not realizing that no sin is innocent. The enemy made you believe that you were just living, and when you got older, you would change. Foolishness. Pass. Strange. Every decision that is made against life produces death. I, I've seen people say sometimes that, man, I wish I would have um, lived a little bit more before I got serious with God. Again, foolish. Because every seed sown is going to reap a harvest. What the enemy does is he lets you be entertained by your sin. Until that thing becomes mature in your flesh to the extent that now it controls you. You wouldn't have had more fun. You have just been given more fuel to the thing that you would need deliverance from when you was ready to face it. You would have only made it stronger and gave your life more of a challenge to defeat this thing. Now you married and with children, and now it's time for you to destroy this thing. But now it's damaging your life. It's damaging your marriage, and it's damaging your, your ability to father your children appropriately. But because you thought you was having fun. But you were actually giving fuel to the thing that was growing on the inside of you. Your pride has become so high that you can't work with nobody else. Your lust for money controlling you to the extent that you take the whole check to the boat. I know you won last week. <laughs> and make sure you put the seed in the ground. <laughs> if you're going to go back, don't take the seed back. Hold on, we're in a serious moment. <laughs> James says... Man is driven away by his own lust, meaning that you saw something so enticing to your eye that you couldn't resist the temptation no matter the sacrifice. Those are the positions that the enemy has held you in, has put you in, to the extent that you cannot defeat or destroy that which you are faced with. And here's the entire point. God had to take you lest this thing destroy you. And hide you in a place and position you in a circumstance which you had to face this thing head on. All of your life you have been feeding it and now controlled by it. The Father needs you for his purpose. So he takes you and places you in the womb, a.k.a. the wilderness. He isolates you and forms a cocoon around you in the name of grace. And he begins to take you through the fire to burn away that image that has tried to destroy your life. The children of Israel left Egypt and went into the wilderness prior to entering the promised land. Not because they needed to mature or grow for the promised land, like we see the emergence of a baby's process, but because they had to die to Egypt. The only reason they were not ready for the promised land was because they still had Egypt in them. And the wilderness was the place for Egypt to die. 
Yes, this has felt like a wilderness season, and you have felt stuck in between your now and your next. Am I talking to anybody in the house? Yes, you have been in the wilderness, and not only could you not explain where you were to others in your life, but you couldn't even understand it yourself. Yes, you went from place from the place of abundance to a place of scarcity, and you have been wondering why. Emotions all over the place with limited peace due to this dry and barren season. But this is what the Lord is saying to you on today. Isaiah 49 and 9. You will say to the prisoners, come out. And to those who are in dark dungeons, emerge. Be free. They will graze beside the roads on all the slopes. They will find pasture. They will find food for their bodies, and all of the mountain places will become their place of testimony. Stand to your feet. Come on, just begin to lift your hands and worship the Father. I prophesy to you today that your dark season is coming to a close. Your waiting season is getting ready to end. You have been hidden and no one else has been able to see your growth. No one has been able to witness all that you have had to die to. Your process has been on the backside of the desert in secret. But it is now time for you to emerge. You have been in the shadows for months. You have been hidden for years. You have been feeling isolated, secluded, and alone. But today I command you to emerge. This is the season in which those that have been in the back, and no, this is not your cliche. You are not just coming to the front, but the father that is standing at the front of the line is getting ready to come take you by the hand and escort you to the front of the line so that all your enemies may see you, so that all those that oppose you may see you and present you before the people. Right past all those that are more qualified. Right past those that didn't even know it would be you. All as a result of your death in the wilderness. This, this process was not in vain. Yes, it has been hard. But no death is ever easy, whether, God, whether it's good for you or not. But if the caterpillar never dies, then the butterfly will never live. If, you, if, you, if your now never dies, then your next will be, no, never be able to come into fruition. So think of what may have not lived through you if the wilderness didn't come. I know it hurt. I know it caused you some pain. But think of what's getting ready to be birthed out of you now. Think about what God is getting ready to do with your life now. The pain of the wilderness is real to the extent that the very food that you eat, the Bible says that it was manna, and it literally meant what is this? To the extent that you ask it through the wilderness experience, what is this? What is this, God? What is this that I'm dealing with? But it was for your purpose. It was for your, your, your strength. It was for God to pull you to a place where he can qualify and use you. That's, all, that's your word on today. You've been qualified. You've been qualified. You've been qualified. You've been qualified for the work. I don't care what they believe. I don't care what they see. Heaven has put his stamp of approval on your life. All because you didn't die in the wilderness in a, in a natural way, but you died in a way where God can use you spiritually. The Bible says that when they were in the wilderness, that an entire generation had to die off. That those that were, I believe, 20 and older, had to die off in the wilderness before entering into the promised land. Why? It was because they spoke against the progress of God's people. 
when they came with the report and Joshua and Caleb said that we are well, more and well able to enter into the land, the other 10 said, no, I don't think so. We're like grasshoppers and I see giants. So what happened was God commanded them to die in the wilderness because they didn't see where they were going. As opposed to allowing the death to come to the thing that was going to keep them from the wilderness, I mean the promised land, they, they, their entire bloodline had to die in the wilderness because of their lack of faith and belief. But God has prepared you to emerge. He has prepared you to come forth to the extent that you will not die in the wilderness. So the altar is Oprah. And what I want to do is I want to pray for those that may have feel or feel right now that they are stuck in the wilderness. You feel like you're stuck in between your now and your next and you don't know what to really do to propel yourself into your next. The altar is open for you. You know that you're in transition, but you need your life to yield over to the command of come out. You know that this is a space you are in, it's captivity. You are in a place of darkness, but you need to emerge because you don't want to die in the wilderness. Come forth now because this is your opportunity to get pushed into your next. I surrender all to you. Everything. Come on, just worship him for a minute. I give to you. Withholding nothing, I surrender all. I surrender all to you. Everything, everything I give, I give to you. To you. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing. Thank you, Father. It's a certain atmosphere that I need in here. So, Father God, we thank you. We thank you for those that have come forth. We thank you, Father God, that they know that there is so much more that you have for their life. And we decree and declare. Woman of God. The Father says tomorrow the door is getting ready to open. I don't even know what it's in regards to, but tomorrow the door is open unto you. We thank you, Father God for your people coming into complete surrender. We thank you, Father God, that you are giving them the strength right now in your son Jesus' name to allow the transition to occur. I thank you, Father, that they are not yielding over to their flesh, but they're allowing their lives to move in the spirit. I thank you, Father, that they are allowing you to have your way. I thank you, Father, that they are submitting themselves over to you. I thank you, Father God, that every hindrance is broken off of them now. Every chain of bondage is broken off of them now. Everything that has restricted them, Father God, is severed off of them right now. And we decree and declare an entry into their promised land. I decree and declare right now in the name of Jesus that the promised land is not restricted to them. But you have given them open access, Father. I decree and declare that those relationships that they need to sever ways with, those things, those things that, Father God, Is this is my aunt, but you know the relationships that need to be let go. You know the ones that need to be released. And what's been hard for you is you didn't have the strength to do it because you love so much. You love hard. But 
You can't love people more than you love yourself to the extent that you're the sacrifice. You're becoming the sacrifice. And we release the weight off of you to feel cross that tebe constantaboko see. I breathe anew over you. And you can be free. I come against the demons and the spirits that will try to destroy your purpose, that will try to come against your assignment, that will try to come against what God has called you to do. I decree and declare that they assignment is null and void and that they cannot do anything to you. I decree and declare that the Spirit of God is lifting a standard around your life right now in the name of Jesus that you may be able to go forth in what it is that he called you to. Let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Till, till there's only you. Let all the other names fade away. Jesus, take your place. Just ask him that. Jesus, take you tried to do too much on your own. You tried to handle it all on your own. That's including your name. What you tried to do yourself, let your own name fade away. Move you out the way so that he can do what he desires to do. Till that's only you. I love Remnant Sunday and Prophet James was so enlightening. We want to make sure that you come out of the darkness and emerge into the light. You are the light of the world. And so don't just hear this word, but go out and do it because God wants us to be kingdom empowered to take over the systems for his glory. We're so thankful that you was here with us today. And we just want you to consider to donate for us. We can't do all of the great things that we do for this ministry without you gracious donors. So thank you who donate each and every week. And if you want to donate this week, if you're on our Facebook page, all you have to do is click donate or you can go to our app and website and click online giving. And we thank you so much so we can continue to do the kingdom work. But we don't want you to leave here without accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Before you can get all of those things that Prophet James talked about, you have to have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And he will help you by way of Holy Spirit, guide you into the light, into your purpose, and into all the things that you're seeking in this world to become so we just want you to just believe and confess that jesus christ is the son of god he died on the cross for your sins and he rose on the third day if you did that we want you to click those connection cards because we want to stay connected with you we are community here online and we just want to reach out to you and make sure that you continue to grow in jesus well thank you for joining us we can't wait till you come back to us on wednesday Thank you for always tuning in to the Valley Experience. We'll see you later.